fellas? Man, if you didn't if you didn't go paintballing, you missed it. Like we had such a good time. Um, the ladies got together for their Bible study on sun, on Saturday, and the guys went and shot some stuff off. We will try to become more spiritual as we grow, but you know what? That is a that's a part of our growth, right? Getting out there and blowing stuff up, man. That's right. <laughs> I love it. Well, look, I, before we get into the offering or do anything else, I want to jump right into Scripture today because it's a special day. We celebrate our 12-year anniversary tomorrow, which is 10-12 tomorrow. And, uh, but today is like the day before, so I want, I want to talk about this a little bit today. I want to share with you. Uh, from the from no matter how long you've been here, if you've been a part of this church from day one, where some of you have, if you if you came sometime over the last you know couple of weeks or whatever, it doesn't matter. Like today, what I want to do is I want to share with you a story of not just the things that we've been through, but what Scripture says about the church. And I I, I don't want this to be about me. I don't want this to be about you know, the, just the things that we've been through, but I want to talk to you a little bit about what the Scripture says about it, but I do want to share a little bit of history because it, it, it might, it will help, like I said, it will help you if you've, if you just come over the last couple of weeks or months or whatever, it'll also help, it'll also, you'll be able to relate to this um, if you've been here for a long time, right? And so, uh, so I want to, I want to just jump right into it. I, I, I want to tell you a story of before we launched, man. This was a, uh, when, before we launched as a church, we had this idea of, I had a t-shirt business back then, and we, were, we bought about a thousand t-shirts. And I'll never forget this, because our neighbors next door were, were kind of helping us out, and they were uh, very, uh, how is the correct way to put this? Uh, immature, maybe that's not the best way. They were new, new believers. They they didn't have a lot of uh, experience when it came to you know being a part of churches and stuff like that, and also growth. But they let us use their house uh, to to roll up these T-shirts and put rubber bands around them and, and flyers around them, and we hit the neighborhoods. And our idea was. We were going to launch on October 12th, which was a Sunday, but what we were going to do before that was spend four weeks trying to kind of do a, a soft opening, if you would, where, where we were going to try to test out our equipment and set up in, in a school where we had already reserved, and we were going to do that, but before we, before we did all that, we were going to advertise it very well so that we could launch, hopefully, with a, with a good group of people. And I remember rolling up these t-shirts and hitting the neighborhood and doing all of this grunt work only to have Hurricane Ike come through on the weekend that we were supposed to, you know, have our very first church, initial church service. And I remember it was September 11th, 12th, and 13th was when Hurricane Ike came through and it basically, all the advertising that we had done was for that weekend, and it just, nothing was able to happen because power was out, nobody could get gas, the schools in the MLB open, and I just, and I just like remembered that that was almost like God telling me, like, you could do whatever you want, but I'm going to do what I want through this church, you know what I'm saying? It was almost like God saying to me, you could have the grandest plans that you want to make, son, but I'm going to do what I want to do through my church. And I, I wrote it like this. Uh, this, was, this is God's church, and he will grow us according to what we can handle. According to what we can handle. This is God's church. And he will grow us according to what we can handle. I also left out, omitted the fact that on our first launch day, which was October 12th, I was hoping for about 300 people. And I think we ended up having like, I don't know, 20 or something there. So it was interesting. And it was all, I wouldn't say it was a slap in the face, 
I just would say that it was kind of a reminder that, that God's going to do what is best for God, right? And I'm just a part of this plan. And so that happened, all right? Uh, and now let me, let me set the stage for an overall picture about churches, all right? Now, you may know some of this, and you may not. Churches are normally structured in one of two ways, all right? Structure, churches are normally structured where the pastor who is mostly a figurehead and a board who is in charge, all right? So there's, there's certain churches that are, that are structured like this, where a pastor is, is mostly just like a figurehead. He, he gives the, he's the face of the church for a period of time. He gives the messages. He goes over certain things. But behind the scenes, there's a bureaucracy that takes place where in order to get anything done, you have to have a consensus with the board that is really in control of the church. That if the board wants to spend money on it, the board has to approve it. The board has to go through things. Uh, so there's a bad and a good about this. The bad part about this is you need consent. You need major majority consent to approve things and get things done. Do you know how hard it is sometimes for me to just get Melanie on the same page as me? And that's just two people. Can you imagine having a board of, I don't know, 15 people and trying to get everybody to agree to something in order to get anything done? The, that's actually called Congress. And you see how effective that is at times, especially over the last several months. So that's kind of a bad thing. I, I guess the good part is is there's a structure there that is there no matter what the pastor is, all right? And so, in fact, in a, in a lot of these churches, there will be new pastors almost once every, you know, four to five to ten years or something. A pastor will come in, do a tenure, and, and he will move on to another church, and there'll be another pastor that will come in, all right? So I guess that's kind of a good thing because if the pastor... I think here was to fall off. It would dramatically affect us, <laughs> you know. But and so and so, I guess that would be the bad thing about the opposite. And I'll go over that. So another way that a church is structured that identifies, I think, more of the way that we are structured is that the pastor who is in charge has a staff who is to help and advise. Okay. And that's the way that we've structured our church. In fact, I would say that's the way that, we've, that a lot of different churches are structured. I would say that this structure is more biblical in the fact that if you look at the way that God operates throughout Scripture, He normally doesn't operate by choosing a board of people to be on a consensus to get things done. Normally, when God operates, He will choose a person to lead a group of people to get things done. And that's normally the way things have happened all throughout the Old and New Testament. Now, obviously, there's a couple bad things about this, or, or a bad thing. The bad part is mostly growth depends on the pastor. Growth mostly depends on the pastor. Uh, the good part is, is that there's no bureaucracy to deal with, all right? The good part is, is that if we want to, you know, knock something out around here, we just do it. You know, I don't have to, I'll maybe ask for, you know, advice if it's a big deal. Like whenever we were getting this whole church, whenever we moved out, and we're doing the foam and everything. I didn't just say, okay, we were going to pay so much. It was, uh, I went to our staff and asked them how, you know, what did y'all think about this? And they actually changed my mind on the situation. When it came to the pandemic and we wanted to move back into the church, I didn't just put my foot down and say we're moving back in. I kind of, kind of put it, it out there to our staff. We prolonged the move back in a couple of weeks. And so the staff is there to, to, you know, to help and advise. But ultimately, I will make the final say-so. And so I just want to set that stage because you, you have to know that the type of church that you're in and the type of churches that are also out there as well. Okay, so now that we've covered that, let me just give you a little bit of history about me real quick. And this is going to be really quick because I don't want me to be a part of this message uh, too much. But over the, over the years, I have gone from being a full-time pastor 
with no side job and no children, okay, to being a full-time pastor with a part-time job and no children, okay? And now I'm a full-time pastor with a full-time job and one child, all right? Times have changed, <laughs> to say the least, all right? And, 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 and obviously, everybody goes through seasons and changes in their own life, so you can, you know, attest to that. So, the truth be told is this has affected how things have gone around here quite a bit, all right? I focus on my message and whatever else I can help with, but most everything else is done by either Melanie or the people, okay? By the way, Melanie put up some of these balloons over here. She is a great helpmate, okay? Yeah, it's an amazing, an amazing helpmate. And honestly, she doesn't, because she's not up here as much, she doesn't get the credit that what goes, but all of, of all the things that she does behind the scenes to help this church out. So if I'm not involved with it, which I have become less involved with a lot more stuff, it's either Melanie or it's y'all, or it's our staff that gets things done around here. So I want you to know that that's where we're at, that if anything is going to be done around here, I'm going to focus on my message, and yeah, I will do as best I can to get whatever else is done, but really, it's up to you. Do you get that? And I, I want you to get that, like, really, fun, really, you know, up front. And I want to show you that this is scriptural at the, at, you know, as we get into this as well. Everybody say it's up to me. That's right. It's up to me. So, so let's, let's get into this. Uh, but first of all, I will say this. I, I made this point. At times, this has not been good enough. However, for those who have stepped up to help, I have seen true growth in them. Okay? I will admit that at times, this has not been good enough. Because it does take organization, it does take uh, a lot of administration, and stuff like that. And a lot of that goes through the cracks. But, on the flip side, for those that have stepped up, man, and I will just say Chaz is one of them, and Josh, and Nina, and all of our staff, and Mark and Martha who do Tuesdays, and I mean, when it comes, and Ann who has helped clean this place on her days, I mean, uh, Jim who just is, is taking, helping with the men's ministry, for those that are involved, our worship and everything, I, I mean, like I said, I don't want to begin na naming that, but for, for if you're involved, I have seen true growth in your life. And I would just encourage anybody else that is not involved, that in order to grow, to see results in your life, you need to be involved in the church. So let me continue now as we get into scripture so now let's let's kind of take me out of it a little bit and let's get into some of the scripture and, I, and you're going to be familiar with this let's look in first corinthians chapter 12 verses 12 through 20 where it talks about the church being a body and let's go through this verse 12 says just as a body though one has many parts but all its many parts form what one form one body so it is with Christ. Verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile. We don't really focus on that anymore. I guess what we should say in its place now is either white or black or Caucasian or African American or Hispanic or whatever. This, regardless of gender and race, now we are still one body, slave or free, and we were given all one spirit to drink. So I made these points just in this. So we may look different. Thank God for that. 
We may look different. We may have different backgrounds, man. Uh, we may enjoy different hobbies. We may be deeply passionate about different things. And so I want you to see that all of us have so many differences. When I, when I talk to people before they get married, I try to warn them as best as I can. Like, do you realize that you're about to spend the rest of your life with this person and they are completely different than you? Completely. They were raised differently. They have a different set of values. They have a different parents and everything else. And you're about to commit to get along with this person forever. Okay? Same in the church. We have so many different backgrounds. We're so diverse. We come from, we have so many different hobbies. I like to fish. Some of you like to play guitar or instruments. And I mean, the list goes on and on. There are so many differences, but yet there is one thing that always brings us together. We are one body, and I want you to get this, not just connected, but we share the same purpose. Do you get that? All of our differences come together under one umbrella, one body, and we all put aside our differences for the purpose of God. Okay? That's the church. And it continues, verse 14. Even so, the body is made up of one, of, of one part, but many. Now, if the foot should say, and this happens so often in the church, now if the foot should say, because I am the, uh, okay, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, or, or maybe I could put it in a different way, because I haven't, you know, experienced the power of the Holy Spirit like you have in myself. I, I really, I'm not a part, of, I'm, not, I'm, I'm different than you in this body. No, you're not. You're still a part of this body. You may be at a different maturity level, but you're still a part of this body. They, they can't say to each other, I do not belong to this body. It would, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. So even though we're different, we can't let our differences separate us. Verse 16, and if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not be for that reason being, to stop being part of the body. So I wrote this. We may not always agree Thank God, because that, that helps us grow. We may not always agree. In fact, we may at times get very frustrated with each other. We may see weakness in another person. But I want you to get this. We are all one body, and our strengths need to be used to complement each other. So what the devil likes to do is to take the things that we disagree on and use that to divide us. But the truth is, is that some of the things that you may disagree on with me, you may be stronger in that than I am. And that could be used to build us up. It could be used to complement us. And that is the way the body works because the truth is, is that my feet are not very good at picking things up. Although I have been known to pick up a pair of clothes with my toes and throw it at Blaze occasionally, but that's what my hands are for. They're designed to do that. And your strengths and your weaknesses all play into this body, and they all complement each other. So let's continue. Look at verse 17 as it gets a little bit more deeper. I haven't heard a train in a while. This is kind of interesting. If the whole body were an eye, where would, we, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. And I wrote this, there, this is not a club. Okay, so what we, what we don't want to do is create the things that we have in common and then develop a church underneath all the things that we have in common, all right? Just because, you know, imagine that. Just because some of us might like a more 
heavier style of music, uh, that shouldn't be what keeps us coming here. Just because some of us, you know, like, you know, Pastor Steve's style, that's not the reason that you show up here. Just because, uh, look around, you're all white, except for one, doesn't mean that should be why you still come here. Just because we find these little things that we can identify with, that we agree upon, that is not why, why we gather here today. And I wrote it like this. This is not a club. This is not a place to come and feel good about yourself. This is not a place to pour out your problems on other people because believe me, they have their own share of problems, okay? This is the body of Christ. This is where you come to figure out what your part is. And I want you to get this because so many times people go to church to get something that they can identify with out of it so that they feel better about themselves. This is not the way the church is designed. The church is designed for you to come, experience the presence of God, and then figure out what your part in this body is, and then do it. And then do it. Paul says, you know, what if the eye says, I'm, I'm an eye, so I can't operate like a foot? Well, that's good. The eye is specifically made for a part of the body that does a certain thing which you should be a part of the body that does a certain thing as well. So the question is, what are you doing for the body? What are you doing for the church? Now look, I know this is more of talking about like the universal church, the big picture church, okay, and we are a local church, but look, that's, there's a reason for that. That's because in the time that Scripture was made, there was literally, literally like one church in the city, and that was it. Everybody was a part of that church. Today we have many, many local churches, and those, all those local churches make up the body. And your part in that make up the entire church, not just the local church. So I don't want you to take this as just as what are you doing in this local church. You can take that as that, but I want you to see the bigger picture of what, the, what, the, 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 what really Paul was talking about is what is your part in the church in general? What are you doing in the body in the church? And the good thing is, is that Paul didn't just leave us hanging to think about this. He actually gave us some specifics. But he goes on and he basically says, look, and I can't say to the hand, I don't need you. I'm going to skip over some of this for time. But just because you're good at one thing, you can't say to another thing that, that, or another person that they're not needed because they do play a specific role in the church. But then he goes on and says this, and I don't have time to break this down, so this is where I'm going for the next week or two, okay? I want you to hear this scripture right here. This is so important. So, so Paul, just to kind of re -revise, uh, re review, Paul basically is saying that a, a body is what the church is. There's many parts of the body. There are specific parts of the body. All of those parts play a specific role. They shouldn't tear the body apart. They should build the body up. And every part of the body has a specific role to play inside the body. But then he goes on and he says this. And at the end of this part where he says, Now you are all the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. So he didn't just... Leave us by saying you're a part of the body. He's about to give us some specifics in 28. And he says, and God has placed in the church, first of all, can you say this? What? Apostles, what next? Prophets, what next? Teachers, what next? Miracles. Hey, we heard about a miracle this morning, man. Do you know God still works miracles in the church? Miracles. Then what? Yes. Gifts of healings. Man, do you know that there's probably somebody in here that has a gift of healing, but you probably don't even know it yet. You probably don't even know it yet that you probably have a gift of healing. And the, pro and the thing is, is that in order to exercise this gift through your faith, 
You have to become a part of the body and, and, and then start working in the church and leveraging your gifts inside of the body. And all of this stuff begins to come out of you where you begin to mature in the body, which you'll see this in a little bit. Look, so gifts of healing, what else? Helping. Helping. That's a big one. And, and by the way, you know what I like about this? It's because everybody can help. You know what I'm saying? So look, if you were reading these off and you were like, I'm not sure I'm an apostle. I'm not sure I'm a prophet. I'm not sure I have the gift of healing. You know, I'm not sure that I'm a teacher. You know, I don't know about all this. All those seem like leadership positions. And I'm not about all that. Well, guess what? There's one in here called helping. I love that. Because that just covered everybody. <laughs> helping. Okay, the next one. Guidance. And the next one. Different kind of tongues. And notice he mentioned that last. Verse 29. He goes on. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have the gift of healings? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now, eagerly desire the greater gifts. And now Paul didn't just end on that. He basically said that there are some greater gifts like teaching, like being an apostle, and like being a prophet and all this. And these are things that we, we should really desire and work towards. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts, and yet I will show you the most excellent way, and this leads us into the next chapter where he begins to show us the most excellent way which he begins to talk about love. And it's the very most popular, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is this, love is that. It's always read at weddings, but it's not geared for married people, it's geared for the church. So it should be read in church, not at weddings, but it's geared for the church. Okay, so look. One of these fits you, and there is a reason that you should fully operate in these parts, okay? One of these fits you. Not every part is a leadership role. Some are just support roles, but they are equally what? Important. Some of these are not all leadership roles. Some of these are support roles. They're all equally important. And now let's get into a little bit of the leadership part where it goes on and elaborates in Ephesians. I just want to end on this scripture, Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles and the prophets, these are ones that we mentioned, evangelism, evangelists and pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. So look, if you are in leadership, one of the things that we have to ask ourselves, myself included, is how well are we uh, equipping people for the works of service because if you if you felt like that throughout this whole process that when it comes to talking about the church that your role is not necessarily a leadership role that maybe your role is a helps role instead well guess what part of our responsibility is to equip you so that you can do the work that you're supposed to do inside the body and so as leadership we have to we have to ask ourselves how, how well we are doing of that as well Verse 13, I want to end on this. Until we all reach what? Is that enough? The unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attending to the whole me measure of the fullness of Christ. This is the goal. And I would say that this is some of the things that I've seen happen in our church. The unity in the faith. Keep that up, guys, please. Sorry, Nina. Be ready to move on. I wasn't ready. Until we reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attending to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That is the goal. The goal isn't to reach... 400 people on a Sunday. The goal is, is that you and I are maturing 
so that we can reach unity when it comes to our faith in Christ. And this is what I've seen in people in our church. Now, I don't know how well we, what we are on the scale. Obviously, there is room to improve when it comes to us and, and our maturity levels. But just an example, this is so small, but it's so, it's so awesome, okay? Yesterday, we went paintballing, all right? And I'm not going to bore you with uh, stories about how I got fired upon by my own teammates way more than I did the enemy, okay? But I will tell you that it was a blast. It was a blast. And now, look, I, I said it earlier, the women were here doing a Bible study on Saturday while the men were out shooting up paintballs and everything else. And, and that might seem very insignificant, all right? But, Josh, you asked the guy that was helping us out. He said he was volunteering, didn't he? So I, I, I latched on to this. It was just a small detail that was throughout the day that I didn't even, that, that, that didn't, didn't really seem very significant to the day, all right? Uh, but the guy, his nickname, I don't even remember his name, the, the, the guy that was leading us throughout the entire day that was over our party, his name was Rambo, all right? And I'm not kidding you, I, we don't, I don't even remember his name, but I remember Josh, just in hearing Josh talk to him a little bit, he basically was volunteering his time up there and, and leading us around. We went and we, it was hot outside yesterday. We were out there and the dude was cool, man. He was like, we're going to play until we run out of paintballs or until y'all all drop on the field or whatever. I mean, just a good guy. It was, I don't know where his heart is about, you know, Christ or whatever. And I don't know that I heard anybody ask him like, hey, man, what does your faith look like? OK, because this was a church group. But I knew that he knew that it was a church group because it was said early on okay so we didn't like hassle him about his faith you know we didn't like hey man come over here are you going to hell or anything like that i mean this was a church group of guys that was out to have a good time and that was it but i caught on to the fact that he was volunteering and at the end of it all i watched about four or five guys tip the guy all right and it was not in the contract. It was nothing that we were supposed to do or nothing like this. But I know that about four or five of the guys tipped the guy for his time. All right. And I don't know what it was. It was probably, it probably all added up to about 50 bucks or whatever. But how cool is it that a, 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 a and I don't know where he stands, but a group of guys go out into a secular environment and can still display the love of God and generosity when it comes to their encounters with other people. And that's really what it's about, about growing in the unity of Christ to where when we get together on Sunday, these are principles that are not just taught but are enacted that are applied, that whenever we encounter our coworkers and paintball dudes and other people, that generosity and love and kindness and, and these things are a part of our faith so much that they're acted out in our life. That's the maturity and the growth that has taken place in the lives of, obviously, the men in our church, the women in our church, and some other people that I know that are connected with us. And that's really what it's about. This isn't a club to get together to where we could all have things in common. This is about growing in our maturity and about taking the principles that we learn here on Sunday, applying them to our life so that we can see God operate because that is when we become and we start operating as the body of Christ. Now I want you to stand up and I want to, I want to conclude with this very last story. <laughs> Another way, another way that I think really, really separates us from the way other churches operate, okay? And this, I believe, is 100% scriptural, and it really challenges you to not just uh, attend, but to exercise your faith in a different way. And you've heard it said from stage more than once. I believe in the tithe, okay? I believe in the tithe as being a principle of the Old Testament, okay? 
But I also believe in the tithe as being a principle of the New Testament as well. Not forced, not a rule that you have to follow, but a principle of giving, okay? And taking what God has given you as far as your income, whatever that might look like, all right? And giving a portion of that as the body of Christ. Now look, I encourage you, as I have many, many times from this stage, to be faithful with your tithe. I mean, yeah, it helps keep the light on and lights on and all that other stuff, but that's not why we're encouraged to give, okay? We're encouraged to give because we are the body. And I don't want you, and I've said this many, many, many times, and I will say it, it's a part of our core, I, one of our, I think our core beliefs that, that here as a church that it cheapens giving whenever you can just come in and write a check and be done with it okay and think that just because you wrote a check to a church that you've done your part in giving and that was it and do you know how many christians do that do you know how many churches preach tithing to the church, almost like it's a New Testament principle that you have to follow. 10%, strictly. It's crazy. Like this, this actually is a modern day thing that churches still preach. All right? Here's what we believe. We believe that generosity comes in way more than 10% at times. And it may come in less than 10% according to what Paul called what you have, not what you don't have. And our church encourages you to give because obviously you should give to the church to, to make sure that we you know, can do what we need to do. But I think more importantly, one of the things, the key things that is separated, and I don't even say separated because that's almost divisive. But one of the things that we have really encouraged you to do, and I want to challenge you to do this over the next couple of weeks, is take your money and be honest about that money that you make and ask yourself how much of it you're, you're giving to the cause of God, how much you're giving to support the body of Christ. And then be honest with yourself and take that money and use it to do something outside of the church. How awesome is You're basically hearing me tell you saying, don't give to the church for the next couple of weeks. Instead, go out and be the hands and the feet of the church and be the body of the church and use your money, use your income to go out and do awesome things being the body of the church. Helping people, seeing a need, and doing it. Supplying something that is lacking. That's what we are supposed to do. That's what helps us reach the maturity level that we need to reach. It's about being that body. And, we, and, and every once in a while, we really have to be reminded and asked, like, how, how are we doing? You know? Are we just going to work and then showing up to church just to, you know, kind of check it off? I, I attended on Sunday. Or, or are we purposely going out, going throughout our week, looking how we can be the different parts of the body? Because when we start actively doing that, that's when we not only will see more people come, but we'll actually see growth in our own personal lives that we haven't seen before. So I challenge you to do that. And I didn't really even want to end on that note, but that's the way it ended. So, Amen. so now, if you want to give, you can give. And if you want to hold it and give it this week, then hold it and give it this week to somebody that can use it. Other than that, let's bless our offering. <laughs> thank you, Father Lord, for this time of giving. And thank you, Father, for this message that is a reminder that we are to be active and not just, you know, not just believers. One of the most profound stories 
that Jesus ever told was the story that the man who built his house on the rock. And in that short parable, it took a a make-believe scenario of a person, of two people that experienced incredible difficulties, but one of them had established their life on things that didn't matter. Probably material things, probably things that, that, that helped them temporarily. But another one had established their life on the Word of God. And the Word of God, regardless of our circumstances, whether we're dealing with back pain or we're struggling financially or we're looking for a job or we've gone through a divorce or whatever that is, through the lowest of lows, through the highest of highs in our life, when we establish our life on the Word of God, it literally will help us in every area of our life grow. And we will not waver And the storm will come, and we will weather the storm because the foundation of our life is not established on things of this earth, but on the eternal principles of you. And so, Father, we ask that you would help us put into practice the things that we need to put into practice. If we need to grow, help us grow in the areas that we're lacking. Help our diversity. Help the things that may look like that are so different, bring us together. And I thank you, Lord, for 12 years of awesome, of being a part of this awesome church and experiencing all the ups and downs and the people and everything. And I just, I know, Lord, I know this is a long prayer, Father, but I know, God, that the people that have walked through this church have experienced what it's like to encounter you. Not because of you know, the things that we've done, but because of the things that you've done through us here. And we love you, Father, for it. And we can't wait to experience more of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Bless our offering, our time together for the rest of the day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on. Whoa, oh. Okay. Did you want to say anything? You good? I wanted to make sure she wanted to, if she wanted to. Oh, there's cake after church. So we don't want to take any of it home in Tupperware. We would prefer you just eat it all, okay, before we leave. And there's the Ladies Fellowship this Saturday. And there's God Talks this Tuesday. And there's church next Sunday. All right, and there's a lot of other things that are going to be happening more and more as we progress. I love you guys. Have a great week. You can come give at this time. If you need to offer an envelope, uh, raise your hand. We'll get that to you. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Happy 12 years.